Michelle Carpenter-Smith. I'm Dave Deutsch. And the project that we decided to take on for this four, for two of the four weeks. Michelle, if you use the mic. I'm sorry, I'm not used to using a mic. Can you hear me? I think it's, it's going into the computer. It's recording. Oh, okay. The project that we took on for t the last two weeks is a prototype of a toy that we think has merit from both an educational perspective and from a technical perspective. And because we were so thankful for Parallax's generous donations, we decided to call it the Robo Clock for a Board of Education. The clock is geared towards students ages four through seven so that they can learn how to tell time. It's not a clock, it's not a timepiece, but it's so that children can learn how to tell time. We chose it because one of the things that we learned over the two week, first two week period is the difference between analog and digital input. And we thought that was a pretty interesting concept. So we included that as a part of our project. We also thought that there were quite a few sensory devices that were pretty interesting. And we chose some that we thought would be really good to use in the clock. Um, and we think that in terms of uh, a business perspective, that there is a market for toys that use microcontrollers, that it's not just for high-tech applications, it's for applications that would interest young children as well. The schematics that we use I'll let you go. <laughs> well, uh, it, I think it's easier just to look at the clock. I mean, Michelle was talking about how somehow or another, we, what we want to do is that when the child moves the minute hand and the hour hand into a position, presses a button, it will display on a four-digit LED counter what time the child has put down. Or in an alternate mode, a game mode, uh, the computer will generate a random time and then the child will have to move the hour and the minute hand into position, press the button, and they will see if they are right or wrong. Um, all the little schematic diagrams that you see in front of you somehow or another go towards, uh, right, right, <laughs> I, so, you know, the, the microcontroller sensing where the minute and the hour hand are and, you know, responding appropriately, either buzzing you right or wrong, uh, or if things work out nicely, uh, telling a robot to move forward if you're right or to move backward if you're wrong. So those are the schematics that you see there. And kind of the, the interesting, well, oh, okay. no, no. Well, you see pictures of the, the breadboard. Uh, kind of the interesting thing for us, or the biggest I see on the breadboard is the clock driver chip itself. Uh, we had to learn a little bit about how the difference between serial and parallel input. Uh, there are seven segments on each LED display times four digits. So that's a total of uh, 28. Uh, LEDs that have to be either on or off at any given time. We learned how to uh, serially drive all of that in uh, one single chip. Uh, the Max 7219 uh, is the chip that, that, that does that. So that's the big guy on the board. Um, okay. There's our LED display, which hopefully you'll see momentarily. We should probably just demonstrate this. Should we? Oh, oh, is there a time? Okay. Um, the one of the, the new technical ideas, one of the new technical ideas that we learned is how to create a digital function by the use of something that doesn't look very high tech at all. And that was this encoder. The, I actually made one. Oh, here it is. I actually made one um, as a prototype before we made one using Geometer Sketchpad software. And this is the plate of a uh, plant holder, you know, so when you water your plants, it doesn't get wet, and electrical tape. And the idea is that I'm going to use this as a 12 o'clock reference, that as you turn the clock, the hour hand specifically, the encoder is recognizing through the use of photoresistors that are differentiating when there's light and dark, it's recognizing binary code, that this is one zero 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 one that's one and then zero zero one zero that's two and so as you go around the clock as you go around the hour hand you're creating a really interesting kind of a 
what? <laughs> oh, sorry, you're tall. <laughs> We're creating digital input. And that was very intriguing to us. I had never seen anything like that before. Um, so we went from this idea to, to this idea. And it's this, that if you were to look really closely inside the box with the light on, I don't want to tilt it, but there it is. And so that when you turn the hour hand, you can see it turn. And that is the digital import, input part of this project. And the way it works is that there's photoresistors sitting right on top of it, and they're recognizing the light and dark. It's simple, but I thought it was sophisticated simple. And we tried to take a picture. <laughs> Didn't come out that well, but you can kind of see the photoresistors. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. You can kind of see the uh, photoresistors and the light bulbs that drive them, and they're just driven by a battery. The minute hand, okay. The hour hand is digital encoding. The minute hand is analog encoding. We have a potentiometer, which is a variable resistor. Uh, as you turn the potentiometer, the resistance varies continuously. Uh, what we did is we tied that to the minute hand, uh, and then we used a function on PBASIC called RC time. Uh, we have it as part of an RC circuit. And we programmed it so that it would count from 0 to 59, just like a minute hand does, um, as you make one full 360 degree turn. And actually, I guess the kind of novel part about this potentiometer that the, at least I was told many people hadn't seen uh, was that this potentiometer is what's called a continuous potentiometer. So it, there is no stopping point uh, when it you know, reaches some like little tab or whatever. Um, that's, that's that. And there it is. It's in, yeah, it's in the lower level, and that's going to be real hard to see without lights on because these lights don't. Do it. By the way, we decided initially that we needed this big, big <laughs> box to enclose everything because we were worried that ambient light might affect the way the encoder worked. It turns out uh, that worry was not quite as, as important. Like, for example, it runs just fine with the door open. We didn't initially expect that. So. So we're going to demonstrate how the game is played for you. Mode one is where you set the hands, press the button, and an LED will show the actual time. So you know, maybe, would you mind just come on up? Come on up. What's your name? Isaiah. 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 Welcome to the robot. Which is the set the man in our hands. In mode one, the user would be practicing telling time. Uh, so, for example, we should just tell everyone what the time you've set because seven. Seven. Seven o'clock exactly. Wait a minute. Um, I mean, sure. Like hour hand, minute hand. Oh, ah. see, that's why we have this game. <laughs> <laughs> seven. And now, if you will give this button on the right here a really good push, and hopefully, we will see something come up. Huh. No. Can it reset? No, let's reset it. There we go. Ah. What did the digital display read? 7.02. 7.02. So uh, in this mode, and the kid could do this all day long, you set the hour and the minute hand, press the button, and the display will tell you uh, what time you have set. Now, if we, thank you, Isaiah. You will receive your parting consolation prizes. The if English I can show. have another volunteer come up and play the game, come on up. <laughs> What's your name? Brandon. 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 Thank you for coming up, Brandon. Brandon, you got to first do me a favor. Push this button really hard. To, to not give it a good shove. Okay. And now give this next one a shove. What he has just done is he's changed mode from that practice mode into the game mode. So I guess that's the mode. This is the game mode. Uh, and it, in this situation, what has happened is the computer has generated a random time. So I'll just tell everyone what random time you have. 412. 412. And now your job would be uh, to try and match with the minute and the hour hand, 412. And you know what? Do me a favor. Make yourself wrong the first time. Not, I'm, not, I'm not questioning whether you can tell time or not. <laughs> okay. So, so you said something that's obviously wrong, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, what time did you set it for? Um, helpful. Like it's 505. 505. 505. Looks okay. about right. Can I just get back? 
And Brendan, right? Yeah. Okay, I want to press this button, give it a good push because it's kind of sneaky. Did ah. you hear that? Wrong. And he was wrong. He got a, a buzzer that's kind of not such a nice sound. And what happened to the robot? Okay. Backwards. backwards. It was backwards this time. Okay. This time, try and get it close to right. Do you want the robot on? Yes, we want the robot on. Okay, so you need the. Mm -hmm. Somewhere approximately there. Now let's keep our fingers crossed. Keep our fingers crossed. It doesn't supposed <laughs> and to. And want to push this button one more time. Did you hear that? So we got. <laughs> we get kind of a happy sound and we move forward. And we're sort of in testing and prototype mode here. However, uh, the idea is that the robot would start from some home position every time you're correct, move forward a step. Every time you're wrong, move backward a step. And after you reach, say, a finish line, it should give you something to happy. So you know what? Let's try this one more time and hope that it works. Why don't I set it to 8.44, please? We might be a little out of the range of the We've been really working on improving the range. LED, which may or may not work at the distance that we have this robot right now. Okay. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, it's out of range. Right. <laughs> out of range. Okay. Yeah. One of the one of the limitations you, of this IR center. Thank you so much, Brandon. You win. One of the um, one of the limitations is the IR center, and we've been talking about ways to either use a different kind of center that might give us a wider range, or either a more sensitive IR center. And I guess one of our limitations is not really knowing right off the bat, oh, this is what we should do. That was the whole point of this course, is to try to figure out how can we solve our problems. Um, skip that one, because we just did that one with the robot. And then, OK. So you know, obviously, two weeks' time, we, we didn't get absolutely everything worked out. I'd say we have a 90% robo clock here. Uh, one of the things that I learned in the last few days, when you encode using binary numbers, uh, the clock doesn't really function exactly the way it ought to. And here's what I mean. When you're going between binary 1, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, and binary 2, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, two lights or two light sensors have to change their state. The odds of that happening simultaneously, really small. Uh, so if you're, not, you know, if you're at unlucky enough to be in the wrong position, you might actually get a number other than one or two reading as you cross the line from one o'clock to two o'clock. Uh, so that's what that gray encoding stuff is all about. It turns out that there's a smarter way to do it, that you can count uh, using you know, four digits or four bits uh, in what's called a gray code that will only change one bit at a time. So that would be kind of tops on my list to change next. And I'm not looking at what else. Um. Well, we just had a couple of, I mean, actually our design considerations are much longer than this, but I would say that these were the primary ones, that our photoresistor armature kept on falling apart and breaking and dying, and we we're trying to find the proper material for that. Um, I limited our sensitivity, as I described, and um, we can make this case a lot smaller, more on the range of something that a child would actually play with. And we definitely would like the robot to be able to move from across the room, not so our sales pitch, because we intend to try to sell this thing. We think that it is an interactive teaching tool. That it's not just sitting at a computer screen. That it can not just only tell time. That we can maybe change the numbers on the face of the clock so that they are binary, binary numbers or hexadecimal numbers so that for all of you really brainiac four-year-olders four -year who need a little more, you know, we've got it for you. And that the boards can be different, that you can practice your multiplication tables or your addition as a youngster. And that given the redu uh, decreasing cost of microcontroller chips, that we think we can produce this for $20 or less. And that includes a track or a maze for the robot to go around, several boards, and the pre-programmed software. And for those parents who really think that they would like to put it together themselves, Maybe we would include the robot unassembled and the programming code. So we have ideas. 
Our plan to market this thing is to kind of get together with Dr. Kapila and the mechatronics department and Parallax and Polly as a whole and see if we can't convince Parallax to take this product on onto their even online site. Um, and we want to sell it to parents, to elementary school teachers. Um, and we think that it would sell really well in stores like the Sharper Image, FAO Sports, and especially online. Um, this was actually a part of our report. We're going to skip this, but it's everything we use. And so in closing, we'd like to thank Dr. Kapila for his amazing visionary leadership for this whole program. Um, Nathan and Yvonne and Hong and all of our graduate students, we think of them as our graduate students. Um, thank you, Alex, because <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to build anything <laughs> if it weren't for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Parallax, of course, for the materials, to the National Science Foundation for the money, and to Dave, Thank you, sir. <laughs> and the rest of our colleagues in the program. Thank you so much.